This is Radiology Case Review, Ultrasound of Testicular Torsion. I'm Dr. Dan Koval from Radiologist Headquarters. This episode is sponsored by Samsung Ultrasound. The beautiful images that you're about to see were obtained on Samsung RS85 Prestige Ultrasound Units. I'm going to show you three unique cases and I'll review key teaching points throughout with a summary at the end. Let's start with case one. This patient presented to the emergency department after experiencing more than two days of scrotal pain and a ultrasound was done. On this transverse view, we see the normal right testis here, and then the left testis is markedly enlarged, heterogeneously hypoechoic, and then this overlying scrotal wall thickening. When we had color Doppler flow, we see normal flow throughout that right testis, but complete absence of flow throughout the left testis. We do see some reactive hyperemia throughout that left scrotal wall. Isolating the left testis on the sagittal image, we still see no internal vascularity on color Doppler. And whenever you're evaluating for testicular torsion, you also want to use something beyond color Doppler like power Doppler, or in this case, we use microvascular flow imaging, which is ideal at detecting slow flow within small vessels. But here again, we see no internal vascularity, just some mild peripheral wall hyperemia. And on transverse images, we see just how heterogeneous that left testis is. These areas of hypoechogenicity likely correspond to necrosis, and the hyperechoic bright areas likely represent areas of hemorrhage. And we also see this scrotal wall edema. On transverse cine imaging, we can see that there's also a reactive left hydrocele. That testis is markedly heterogeneous, and we see this scrotal wall edema. And then notice that there's this globular pseudomass at the superior margin of the testis within the scrotal sac. We can see that better on this sagittal cine clip. This represents redundant bunched up spermatic cord, or spermatic cord epididymal complex. And that's a common finding that we see in the setting of testicular torsion adjacent to the torus testis. Because this testis was so heterogeneous, it was found to be necrotic and infarcted at surgery and had to be removed. Now let's look at the patient's normal right testis for comparison. You can see it's homogeneous, much more echogenic than that abnormal left testis. And then what's this little triangular echogenic focus? This is the normal testicular mediastinum. Here's the normal sagittal appearance of the right testis, and here's the normal color Doppler appearance throughout the testis showing arterial and venous flow. Whenever evaluating testicular torsion, it's imperative to also evaluate with spectral Doppler and look at the waveform morphology. This is a completely normal arterial waveform of the right testis showing that low resistance flow with a slow, gentle systolic upstroke. This is the peak systolic velocity, and then this is the diastolic flow. Now, it's important to note that you can still have color Doppler and spectral Doppler flow in the setting of torsion but the waveform should be abnormal. It will either be diffusely dampened or you might see peaked systolic flow with a brisk upstroke and then absent or reverse diastolic flow. Those findings would be highly suspicious for torsion. But in our case, the contralateral left testis, which was the torsed one, had absolutely no color Doppler, so we couldn't get any waveforms. All right, now let's review case number two. So this was a pediatric patient presented to the emergency department with acute scrotal pain, and we see the testis is mildly heterogeneous on the left, but not nearly as heterogeneous as that prior case. It looks similar on the transverse view here, and when we add color Doppler, there's no internal vascularity. We confirm that by evaluating with microvascular flow, and again, we see some mild peripheral hyperemia, but nothing within the testicle. And we want to compare that to the contralateral normal right testis, which does have normal color Doppler flow here, but no flow in that left testicle. You can also notice on these comparison images how much larger that left testicle is compared to the right and also the overlying scrotal wall thickening. Because this testis was not necrotic and infarcted, it could be successfully salvaged at the time of surgery and the patient underwent an orchiopexy. But before that, let's look a bit more closely at that left scrotal sac. So we can see that there's that peripheral hyperemia in the wall and a reactive hydrocele, but then what's this globular echogenic area here adjacent to that torus testis? Well, that's that redundant spermatic cord that we saw similar to the last case. It's bunched up spermatic cord, epididymal cord complex, and you can see it has no internal vascularity, just like the torus testis itself. And you can see here it's partially swirly. It's not a true whirlpool sign, which I'll show you in the next case, but you can see why this is sometimes called a torsion knot. And here it is on the transverse dual screen cine clip. There's no flow within that mass. And that's how you can differentiate it from a paratesticular neoplasm or acute epididymitis because both of those diagnoses should have hyperemia in this region. And again, there's that reactive hydrocele. Let's look at the final case, case three. So this is a patient that presented to the emergency department with only two hours of scrotal pain. And we see that there's no color Doppler flow to that left testis. We already have a reactive left hydrocele. When we compare to the right testis on this transverse view, you can see that the lie of the testis, the orientation is abnormal. So normally the testes will be vertically oriented within the scrotal sac, but this left one is horizontal. So whenever you have a horizontal or a oblique diagonal lie of the testis, that raises suspicion of torsion. 
And while this is a useful image to obtain, you want to be careful when evaluating color Doppler flow on this combined image because just due to testicular orientation, it could be misleading as to whether or not there's truly flow. But when we evaluate each testis separately with the same vascular parameters, we can see that there's normal microvascular flow to that right testis, but no flow to that enlarged left testis. And the testicular volume here is 27 cc's, which is enlarged. The normal adult volume of the testis is about 20 cc's. Now, whenever evaluating for testicular torsion, it's critical to look at the spermatic cord as it enters the scrotal sac. In this case, we saw a striking whirlpool sign indicating a complete twist of the spermatic cord. And you can see that that's located superior to the involved testicle. There's also some bunched up redundant spermatic cord adjacent to the site of the whirlpool. And there's some posterior acoustic shadowing there, which is a typical finding. When we evaluate this on dual screen color Doppler imaging, you can again see that whirlpool sign, but notice how the color flow is intact leading into it, and then we completely lose it because that's the site of the torsion and the vasculature is occluded beyond that point. And we can see this avascular torsion, not just distal to the whirlpool sign. And the adjacent testicle itself, again, has no vascularity. Now, because the patient presented so quickly to the emergency department, the testicle was successfully salvaged. When it was detorsed, it reperfused, and that goes along with the homogeneous appearance we saw on ultrasound without evidence of necrosis. All right, now let's review some key points for testicular torsion, and you can also find these in the episode show notes. So torsion occurs when there's a twisting of the spermatic cord cutting off the blood supply to the testis. And that's due to a bell clapper deformity. That's the most common cause. And that occurs when there's an abnormally high attachment of the tunica vaginalis, which allows the spermatic cord to rotate 360 degrees or more and cause testicular torsion. And that type of torsion is known as intravaginal torsion since it's due to the tunica vaginalis abnormality. And torsion is a bimodal distribution. It's seen most commonly in the first year of life, and that's due to an extravaginal cause, not due to a bell clapper deformity. And then later in adolescence and young adults, due to this intravaginal cause that we just talked about. The whirlpool sign is when we see an itty swirl of the coiled spermatic cord located superior to the testis. And while this is a highly specific sign for testicular torsion, it's less commonly seen than the redundant spermatic cord that I showed you in the first two cases. And that redundant cord is also known as a boggy pseudomass, a torsion knot, or perhaps more specifically, an epididymal cord complex. And it should be avascular or at least not hyperemic. And that's how you can differentiate it from a paratesticular neoplasm or epididymitis. And it's important to look at the testicular orientation. So normally the testicular lie is vertical within the scrotal sac, but if the testis is horizontal or oblique, as in diagonal position, that is suspicious for torsion. Other secondary findings commonly seen are testicular enlargement, reactive hydrocele's, and scrotal skin thickening. And if you see marked testicular heterogeneity, that's usually a finding of late torsion and suggests non-viability or testicular necrosis. And we typically see that after 24 hours of torsion. The treatment is detorsion and orchiopexy if blood flow returns to the testis and it's deemed salvageable. Otherwise, orchiectomy with testicular removal may be required. Now, it's important to also note that although the likelihood of testicular salvage is related to the time of symptom onset and subsequent detorsion, it's also related to how tightly the cord is twisted. For example, if the cord is twisted 720 degrees, the testis may become non-salvageable before 24 hours, whereas if there's a less than 360 degree torsion, the testis may still be viable for days. So the take home point there is don't delay the diagnosis and subsequent surgery. If you'd like to learn more about this topic, check out the great article listed below by Drs. Bandekar and Blask, published in Pediatric Radiology. All right, thank you for joining me. And thank you again to our sponsor, Samsung Ultrasound with the RS85 Prestige. If you like this lecture, please subscribe to the video podcast or on YouTube. To see bonus teaching material that I post throughout the week, click the YouTube community tab or follow us on social media. Until next time, radiology is life.